Have any therapists returned my calls yet? No! Did you bring me the cyanide I wanted? No! Well then piss off. Fuck, I hate my life right now. Every few weeks since June, another set of misfortunes seems to fall right into my lap. If I actually believed in God, I'd swear the spiteful bastard was trying to fucking kill me. Come on, Mom, it's not all that bad. Hilda came out this year and Auntie Carousel thought it was good. Oh yeah, great, Billy. That's just fucking wonderful. That's just what I need. Another fucking Netflix show. Because as we all know, Netflix's horrid excuse for television cures all wounds. Mom, we both know you'd only stop working if a universal basic income was established, so you must have been doing something besides feeling sorry for yourself and going insane. Well, I guess I've been thinking about the miserable state of LGBT representation in the wake of the Steven Universe video going viral and She-Ra coming out to underwhelming reception. There you go, talk about that. From in there, far away from me. Your concern is really fucking appreciated, by the way. LGBT representation is in something of a dark age right now. Unless a work is rated 18+, the likelihood of seeing canon gay or trans characters is absurdly low. The increase presence, and I use the word extremely loosely here, of LGBT characters in children's shows is a major milestone because it works to undo the artificial stigma of LGBT relationships as being entirely sexual, which many straight people sincerely believe, and hopefully undo the damaging things that conservative parents are teaching their own children. Unfortunately, it's a struggling uphill battle to actually win, largely because of both creators and audiences being too willing to concede too much fucking ground. The trend of gay characters showing up and then almost immediately dying is a well-documented one that remains absurdly popular despite the implication it creates that gay people's only role in life is to die, but that's been getting more and more pushback lately, especially in the wake of Voltron's big, massive, gaping fuck-up. Voltron introduced a character who was the ex-boyfriend of one of the main cast, or he might have been a present boyfriend, I don't know, I'll Google it, and then a shitstorm erupted when they killed that character off in the exact same episode. This was preceded by the creators bragging about how important LGBT representation was to them, and about all the amazing work they were doing that the community was going to love. Now, a creator bragging about how enlightened they are is always a red flag that things are about to go very wrong, and go very wrong they did. In truth, in truly predictable fashion, this open pride did a complete 180 once the episode came out and people were rightfully furious. Suddenly the creators became all meek and submissive and talked about how they had to resort to this because it was all DreamWorks would allow, how they fought tooth and nail with the studio just to get the privilege of killing a gay character. The studio won't let us, is a common excuse made by creators and fandoms alike. Unfortunately for both of them, this tends not to be the case for other creators. Darren Nefsey had this mandate for Star Wars The Forces of Evil that if there are couples in the background that some of them have to be same-sex couples, a mandate that Disney once tried to push back against and asked them to change, and Nefsi simply asked, why? And Disney almost immediately caved. Alex Hirsch had the exact same experience with Disney when trying to make gay characters for Gravity Falls. Hirsch remarked that Disney was clearly afraid of getting emails from bigots and they're cowards, so they're letting the bigots control the conversation. This will be important later, so I want you to hold on to it. Rebecca Sugar, according to some sources, apparently threatened Cartoon Network that if she didn't get her gay wedding episode for Steven Universe, then she would quit and take Steven Universe with her. And Cartoon Network caved to that and let her have her gay wedding episode. This is really important because Rebecca Sugar made the emptiest fucking threat in the world and Cartoon Network caved to her demands. Steven Universe has experienced plummeting ratings for several years now, and Rebecca Sugar's behavior as a creator has only ever been a liability for the network, and they caved to that threat anyway. Why? Because just like how networks are afraid of getting emails from bigots, they're also afraid of getting emails from actual human beings for being bigots. And Rebecca Sugar is just spiteful enough to make a stink about it if Cartoon Network were to fire her. So when it's clearly established that network executives will cave when the creators push back against them and Rebecca Sugar makes the world's emptiest threat, how is it that lazy slapdash shit like this keeps happening? How is it that this circle of empty, malnutritious, vapid excuses for representation and creators being genuinely surprised when they're terrible right gets rejected never seems to end? Well, it's because, and I say this with love, LGBT fandoms have fucking terrible standards. Look, I know this is the second episode in a row where I shit on some subset of the LGBT community, but bear with me, this is important. We covered a little bit of this in Slurred Speech, where the LGBT equivalent of a minstrel show has been applauded as part of gay culture for years just because it slightly depicted fluid sexuality and had some shitty songs in it. Voltron might have gotten pilloried for the awful barrier gaze trope, but The Legend of Korra was praised to high heaven by LGBT fans despite using the equally awful last second relationship trope. A lazy attempt to shove representation in the last possible moment when there's nothing left to lose was called Revenant revolutionary, and a huge step forward. Several years later, Adventure Time would have the same experience, where they spent eight years teasing a gay relationship and then piled it in at the last possible second of the last episode and was lauded as revolutionary. Once again, the same thing happened twice and we pretended as if it was an amazing leap forward both times. Even more recent attempts at this, like She-Ra and the Princesses of Power, are only dipping a toe into the representation pool by giving romantic
romantic subtext between two of the lead characters, but still no word as to whether this will become an established relationship in a timely manner or save for the series finale when the production team doesn't have anything to lose. They still dawdled on introducing an actual gay couple until the very last episode of the season, and Bo apparently has two fathers, but they're still stuck in the limbo of writer confirmed it on Twitter. Once again, this was called a wonderful leap forward and revolutionary, and the slow burn LGBT romance of our dreams. Come on guys, if we're gonna have that low standards, we should acknowledge that the pioneer of this revolutionary step forward was JK Rowling 11 years ago. I make this distinction because where you stow the gay characters is almost as important as having them in the first place. Just like how it was a big deal that the first gay character in Overwatch was the series mascot Tracer, and not some D-list hero that nobody likes, like D.Va. It's equally important that gay relationships be allowed to flourish within the main cast. she executive producer is an LGBT woman herself, as people insist on telling me when I bring this up, but so was Rebecca Sugar and she thought this was acceptable. she even becomes more annoying about this because the relationship between Catra and Adora is described as complicated, but the two are always getting really close and touchy-feely, Catra pounces on her constantly, and in the first episode it's shown that Catra sleeps at the foot of Adora's bed. This isn't subtext, this is the writers being needlessly fucking coy and using the term complicated in place of something more racy like girlfriend or wife. And a lot of LGBT fans were already calling this an amazing leap forward rather than the jogging in place that it really is. DreamWorks, you can't tell me you're afraid of the cyber Nazis losing their shit on you because you're already fucking doing that. Unfortunately, part of this can be attributed to the completely broken and backward way that so many people think romantic subplots have to be written. One of the big reasons that The Legend of Korra had such painful romantic subplots was because they were never actually allowed to start. They were constantly waffling around and doing nothing. Getting together didn't happen until the very end of the story. Even when they had established relationships in a timely manner, they were constantly ripping them apart so we could just go through this nightmare once again. Many shows treat both gay and straight relationships this way. A relationship is its own subplot and we never move past the prologue for some reason. We keep getting another Ross and Rachel story and we're surprisingly short on Monica and Chandler's. The best couple ever put on TV are Gomez and Morticia Adams, who are married and have their own kids right from the start of the series. They were great, they were fun, they were delightfully romantic. Everyone remembers them and everybody loved them, yet for some reason, we can't have any more of it. And whenever I bring this up, people argue with me that the period before a relationship actually starts is the most important to tell. So important that it needs to take anywhere from four to eight seasons to actually get to. It's one of those stubborn absolutist beliefs that people hold despite all evidence to the contrary, like how serialization automatically makes a show better despite so many shows not being equipped to handle it. People still hold this belief even while complaining about how bad and dragged out romantic subplots are. The solution always seems to be to make every character functionally asexual, rather than to just get your ass in gear and start telling the real story. It never occurs to people to try starting a story with the characters already together, or having them get together halfway through the first season and stay together for longer than a few episodes. The only reason Steven Universe was the first one to reach gay wedding was because most stories don't even bother to get that far at all. This aggressive, stubborn belief that romantic subplots have to end with the characters getting together perpetuates the laziness and slapdash writing that goes into LGBT representation, especially when it comes to the dialogue that has to be laced with subtexting euphemisms. When a character is pining after someone of the opposite sex, you can basically be as blatant in depicting them as you want, but when it's time to pine after someone of the same sex, suddenly things have to be a lot more subtle and you never say anything outright. You're not clever, people can see how much of a fucking tease you are and you can't keep stringing people along like this and refusing to commit. The writers, I mean. LGBT fandoms are so starved for content that when we're thrown rotten, maggot-infested scraps, we treat it like steak. And so creators are accustomed to not having to put very much effort into writing a decent story. The writers of Voltron didn't even try pressing the studio further than bury your gaze because they were convinced that fans would adore that garbage they'd written. So sure of this they were that they publicly bragged about how important representation was to them. And it's no surprise that they were able to think they could get away with it because there's precedent set for us to get the slightest acknowledgement or glance in our direction and then start cheering and holding up the creators as parents. Paragons. So if you're a performative ally looking for cheap and easy praise, this is where you can get it. Worse off, this is treated like actual discourse. A lot of fans will make the case for this acceptance of bullshit on the basis of, I mean, it's better than nothing after all. The problem is that just like a bad marriage, when you settle for less, you're expected to stay there. When people complain about this complete disregard of LGBT fans, there will always be someone to jump up and go, Ugh, you'll never be satisfied. 
And there are a lot of LGBT people who are obsessed with making sure they don't look bad to conservatives and will cave to that pressure to just be quiet and be happy with table scraps. As I mentioned earlier, and we're finally coming back to, a lot of studios drag their feet because they're afraid of getting angry letters from bigots because conservatives will scream and throw their shit all over the walls when they're not happy. And the problem is that we don't do the same when we get routinely fucked over. Studios are not afraid of us making noise because we're very good at silencing each other. Many LGBT fans are so wrapped up in respectability politics that they will do everything they can to not bring themselves to the level of their political enemies. I'll say it right now, the half of the Voltron fandom that was flipping over tables and screaming at people over this had the right idea, because making noise is exactly what studios are afraid of happening, and then it happened anyway. When you kick up a riot, then you have headlines, you have creators trying to firefight, you have people at Disney and DreamWorks getting stressed the fuck out dealing with your endless, incessant moaning. Despite literally owning the world, Disney caves to the fear that the right will kick up a stink about increased presence of gay characters, but they're not afraid of the same thing happening from the left. We need to change that, because nobody likes dealing with that kind of press. PR is a very important thing, and studios get comfortable resting on their laurels because they know their LGBT fanbase will by and large keep quiet in the hopes of seeming better than their enemies. The respectability politics has to end. It's time people actually had the spine to just say, this is not good enough. Glorification of abuse and slavery is not good enough. Gay characters that die is not good enough. Last minute, last episode relationships are not good enough. Background characters are not good enough. Characters that only ever have cameo appearances are not good enough. Vaguely flirty subtext filled with euphemisms are not good enough. If it's not in the main cast and it's not an established relationship from the get-go, it's not good enough. One benefit of my coverage is that some of my viewers did watch through the entirety of She-Ra for the interactions between Catra and Adora, and they got to the end of the season before coming back and saying, I feel so gay baited. And that's what this shit is. They're baiting you. Animation Studios have been doing this for decades. Kim Possible did the same shit until everyone kicked up a riot and got a fourth season out of it. Star vs. the Forces of Evil has been doing it with Starco. Ship teasing is not a new tactic. It's been a sleazy ratings inflating trick for a long time. It's time we stop falling for it. No more settling. No more being happy with table scraps. No more choosing icons from a conga line of monsters just because it's all we have. It's time to stop being quiet just for the sake of the comfort of some rich assholes just because we stupidly want to seem more dignified than the people who want to kill us. This shit's not good enough and it won't be tolerated anymore. No more subtext. I want the lesbian equivalent of Gomez and Morticia and if you're not willing to commit to that then I better not fucking see you bragging about how important representation is to you because you're a liar. Fire.